I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susi. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. And I'm JT Timmons. And today we are going to be dabbling into something that we don't always go into, which is true crime. Ah. Uh, yes. Um, so we are going to be starting out a new type of episode here called True Crime Tuesdays. Uh, now, this will not be every Tuesday, but every once in a while, we might throw you a little bit of a curveball. So today we are going to be discussing a serial killer that murdered in Savannah. Mm-hmm. Um, so before we get into that, I'm going to throw it over to JT real quick so yes. that I can do a few announcements. All right. Thank you, Madison. So with Patreon, we have some upcoming exclusive content to discuss so if you're not a pair junkie you really 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 should consider it uh the first thing we have coming up is the meldrum train disaster mobile podcast uh we went to meldrum georgia and we had a great time uh you know kind of walking through the super scary woods we filmed the whole thing and um it is going to and we went to where the train uh, blew up and killed 23 people? Yep, 23 people. All right, so uh, Meltem Train Disaster is coming up uh, for the para junkies. Um, we have a series. I know you've heard us talk about it before, but we have the most haunted city on earth, the series, which is going to play out like a television show and a podcast fusion. It's almost like a, a new media. Um, and the pilot episode, the Sorrel Weed, I'm going to do, we're doing all we can um, to get it up next week. Uh, but the pilot episode on the Sorrel Weed, we're working with the Georgia uh, Historical Society and getting some like, you know, old photos of the Sorrel Weed, something that's like, you know, some stuff that's like never been seen before. So we're really, really working to do that. Um, and it is going to be our biggest undertaking yet. It's going to be really, really great. And we've already shot the second episode of the series. Uh, we filmed it actually last night. That was fun, right, Maddie? It was Definitely an experience. It was creepy, uh, yes. to say the least. We filmed at the Great Face Museum um, and mainly in a room that has the most John Wayne Gacy paintings in one room in the world. He's got tons. I mean, how like hundreds potentially just line the walls of paintings that John Wayne Gacy actually painted. So we did a paranormal investigation in there. We're one of the only people to ever do a paranormal investigation in the Great Face Museum. So you really if you're if you're not a para junkie, check it out. Check it out. So um Last couple things. Uh, We have an exclusive podcast every single week for Para Junkies. Um, It's really, really great. We kind of, it's more relaxed. It's less structured than this. And and Mm -hmm. people, you know, we just have a great time. Um, We want to thank all the people that have become uh, Para Junkies uh, over the last couple months because, you know, y'all just building up, uh, you know, and supporting us. We have been able to do much more with this brand and with all the stuff that we're that we're doing you know we're able to go places now so that's really really cool we're able to get into places we're able to show people hey we have a following it's really really awesome so um all of this is for para junkie eyes only uh one last thing i am gonna most likely go uh be adding a do- uh, a support button on patreon which is basically going to be a tier that you know if you just want to support us with a couple bucks that's how you can do it. So we really, really appreciate that if you do that. And um, Madison, I'm going to throw it over to you real fast to talk about your jewelry, and then we're going to get started. Yep. Uh, so some of you probably don't know, uh, but I actually make jewelry as well as all the other things that I do. Um, you can buy it in person here in Savannah, and that's pretty much how it's been uh, the entire time I've been making jewelry. But I have decided it might be a fun idea to offer it to y'all. Um, so basically what I make is, you know, witchy style jewelry, lots of ghosts, lots of witchy kind of looking items. Uh, also, I specialize in spell jars. So I make 
custom spells in a jar essentially that you can wear on your person for whatever intention that you need whether it be uh, money attracting you know for self-love for anti-anxiety slash anti-depression things like that Um, so if that is something that you're interested in we are going to be trying to getting uh, to get that up on uh i would say like the weekend yeah it's probably gonna be it's probably going to be next week yep next week so i'm working really hard to make a bunch of stuff for you guys so if that is something you're interested definitely keep an eye out for it and we'll let you know when we're gonna drop it for sure so cool cool all right announcements over let's get started all right so Today, we are going to be discussing the serial killer referred to as the I-95 killer. An absolute jerk. He is an absolute jerk. You are not kidding about that. Um, and that is a man named Gary Ray Bowles. Mm-hmm. So, um, like I said, he is referred to as the I-95 killer. Uh, his murders range from March to November in 1994. So, a uh, Hmm. Yeah, I know. It's actually kind of surprising because he was kind of after the massive wave of serial killers in America. Uh, But he uh, only uh, ended up killing, as of what we know, is six people. Okay. So he did it on my birth year. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah. And only on my birth year. There was no other time? No. Not that, we, not that we're aware yeah, of, at yeah. least. Um, but for like what he was convicted and what the police are aware of, it's only it was only in 1994. That's like a spree. Yeah. So basically, how and not he went candy. So, right. So basically, how he went about it is uh, why he's referred to as the I-95 killer is because he traveled di- down I-95 and stopped in different cities and killed in those cities, oh. and uh, ended in Jacksonville because he was caught. So, gotcha. and we'll get into that, but. Basically, um, he typically strangled his victims to death. He also would beat them, but usually the final last thing was a strangling. Mm -hmm. Um, But his signature was kind of odd. So if you're not familiar with serial killers, a lot of serial killers do have like something that they do to signify that it was them and not just a random killing. So what... They, what he would do is that he would often shove things down the throats of the victims. And so, for example, um, some of them had rags, toilet paper, dirt, leaves. And with one victim, it was actually a sex toy that he shoved down their Jeez. throat. Yeah, he was a really awful man. I mean, obviously, he was a bad man. He was a serial killer. But um, he was not kind to his victims in, uh, when they died. Serial so. killers usually aren't. Yeah, you wouldn't expect <laughs> it. But he typically targeted um, gay men mm-hmm. who were over the age of 30. I think his youngest victim was like 35 years old. Wow. And his oldest was 72. Holy crap. Yeah. Um, But it didn't seem like he necessarily had a preference between those age ranges. That's just, I think, because he started murdering uh, his murder spree when he was 32. I think that was just who he had access to um, or, or, like, could get the attention of, essentially. Sure, sure. So, um, basically, let's start with his early life. We're only going to go a little bit into his early life because I personally, like, I feel like it's interesting to know, but I don't like to dwell on why necessarily he started killing Um, okay but so uh you don't like to dwell on why he started killing why because it it, because of trauma and stuff i'm like like sure he has he had trauma for sure but i don't necessarily like to dwell on the killer per se like of like justifying no i understand that so um but yeah so bowles was born in clifton forge virginia his father, William Franklin Bowles, had died six months before he was born from black lung disease working in the coal mines of West Virginia. And his mother, Frances, remarried several times. Um, Bowles was abused by his second stepfather, who was a violent alcoholic, who also abused Bowles' mother and older brother. Hmm. And the abuse continued until he was 13 years old. And Bowles would fight back and severely injure his stepfather. So that was kind of like the first signs of violence, really. Okay. Um, I couldn't really find any of like the, you know, typical warning signs of a serial killer, if that makes sense. So like no fire, wet in the bed, anything like that? No, I didn't see anything about that. Um, You know, so, and it is possible that he could have 
had um, those sort of symptoms, but I personally feel like he's more of the Eileen Warnos type, where he was a turned psychopath. So okay. not necessarily like Ted Born Bundy that. who, or like Jeffrey Dahmer, who you know were like showed those signs of like being having psychopathy or like at a young age. Yes, mm-hmm. um, but because a lot of his trauma did occur during his developmental years, it could have made him into having that psychopathy, kind of like how Eileen Warnos was when she was a child. Sure. So, um, but basically. Uh, Bowles would fight back and severely injure his stepfather. He would then leave his home soon after, like he would run away. And uh, which anger, uh, because he was angered by his mother's decision to remain in the marriage. So that's why he ran off. Uh, He became homeless for the next few years and he earned his money as a prostitute at 14 years old. Yep, that, that, that sounds like Eileen Warno's type. Exactly. Okay. So, so, so there was a, you know, it's important, yes, not to make excuses for that type of, uh, you know, behavior. behavior but, but I do, I do re- recognize that, like, you know, people like Eileen Warnos, um, especially her, um, a certain amount of traumatic event, if, if there's like a, if there's even a little bit of that ultra violence there, you know, those traumatic events can breed way worse ultra violence. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and honestly, uh, the trauma is where the similarities ends with Eileen Warnos mm-hmm. and Gary Ray Bowles because Eileen Warnos, a lot of her um, reasonings behind her killings was because she was trying to support her girlfriend. Yeah. Like, and a lot of hers came from like this really demented form of love. Sure. But with Gary Ray Bowles, it didn't. It there was no love. There was no love. No. He's so, a, he's a full blown. Yeah, he's yeah. a full blown narcissistic psychopath. Yes. Yeah. Um, and absolutely. In 1982, he was actually arrested for beating and sexually assaulting his girlfriend in Tampa, Florida. Whoa. Um, and was sentenced to six years in prison. But what is it, with Florida? The, they all go there. They all end up in Florida. I don't know what it is. I think it's something to do with the water. It's just like I know. they they all end up there. Um, but after his release from prison in 1991, he was convicted of armed robbery in the theft of an elderly woman's purse, a crime for which he was sentenced to four more years in prison. But he was only released. Uh, he was released after only two years. And he, did he did he hurt the? Do we know if we hurt the old woman? No, it was just robbery. It was just robbery with yeah. a gun or a he knife. He was okay. definitely an opportunistic, yeah, criminal. Um, compulsive. So, yeah, very compulsive. He Sounds definitely like just you know, and a lot of his murders had elements of robbery with them, and you know, just like crime in general. Because when you live on the streets long enough, I would assume you take whatever opportunity you get to get yeah. money and so especially the way he w- he basically grew up uh, like that's, at 14 yeah exactly that was how he knew <laughs> yeah. how to get money so i think that has a lot to do with it but that's about um everything you really need to know about his early life and i think it shows like a pretty good understanding because his uh crimes obviously started very quickly after he went uh got out of prison in 1991 Okay. So his crimes began in Daytona, Florida. Um, and yeah, I know. <laughs> so okay. um, his crimes began in Daytona, Florida, when Bowles allegedly beat and strangled his roommate, John Hardy Roberts, who was 59 years old, to death. Um, and so pretty much he started in Florida and then he immediately jumped up to Maryland as his oh, wow. next crime. Um also, it's important to note that the reason why he also got away with a lot of this is because he used an alias oftentimes. Okay. So let me just start with the timeline of things. So pretty much it was he murdered in Daytona. Then he went up to Wheaton, Maryland in April. And he would um, murder a man na- uh, named David Jarman on April 14th, 1994. Okay. And along with that, he stole his credit card, stole his money, and his car. If he had the opportunity to steal a car, he would. Sure. Um, but. He seems pretty disorganized. He was very disorganized. Yeah, he doesn't seem like, you know, BTK. He doesn't seem like, you know, 
Gacy or, or oh no, absolutely he not. Seems very compulsive. He and very so that's actually very interesting too because and we'll get into more of this when we get into the trial. But he was he had an IQ of like seventy four. Oh wow! So he was not smart. yeah. He's like Otis too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. And so pretty much how he went about things, how he met his victims, uh-huh. is he would go to gay bars. Mm. and uh, various towns and he would flirt with people and oftentimes how he got uh, in with these people is that he would tell them like he would do like chores and stuff if they would let him stay with them. Uh. Um, he would do chores or he would perform sexual acts depending on the person. It's it's very, I, I'd like to say that it's very interesting that um, there's so many similarities in this guy that, of other serial killers like Mm -hmm. he would find his victims in gay bars like Dahmer he was caught in Florida and executed sorry he was caught in Florida and there's there's some stuff else that happens in Florida (laughs) Uh, like you know like Bundy and like Eileen Warnos Um, you know I mean he's he's crossed paths with with these killers Mm -hmm. like for sure like like not not like you know physical paths but like actual like where they went he went um you know there's just a there's just a this guy's like oh and then he's got the iq of otis tool so it's like it's like he's got he's got like a bunch of different killers like inside of him it's really weird and it's not to say that he didn't take from other serial killers because he lived through a period of time where he lived in like the I guess, best time of American history to uh, study serial killers. Sure. He lived through the 70s and the 80s. Absolutely. So, you know. Um, so he so he learned, he learned yeah, a lot. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yes, so he would then go to Maryland. Then he would go to Savannah. He would murder in Atlanta. And then he would stop in a few other places, ending in Jacksonville. Okay. So that was... Kind of the time. I ninety five doesn't go through Atlanta though. Well, I know, but that's uh, they're what, just being. Yeah, they're, to make it's it like it's basically I ninety five. Yeah, to make it like you know a button, the media gave him the i ninety five killer name, but uh, kind of he yeah. he kind of just went down i ninety five. But regardless, um, so one of the murders that we're going to focus on heavily is the murder that happened in Savannah because obviously we're from Savannah. That's how we really found out about Gary Ray Bowles is because of uh, Milton Bradley's murder. All and these all these um you know murders are very tragic. Milton Bradley's is is ext- like I mean It's a very sad story. Very tragic. Very um, tragic. Yeah, the reason why we actually found out about Gary Ray Bowles is because Savannah does not talk about this story often. I do want to say that. Nope. Um they, they and we've had two serial killers come through Savannah and nobody talks about it. It's really odd, actually. Because we're beautiful old Savannah. Yeah, we, we don't, don't do nothing wrong. We didn't have no serial killers. Um, no. Not us. But yeah, so JT and I are freaks, and <laughs> we were driving through Jacksonville one time, and we sometimes, when we're driving through various places when we're on road trips, we like to look up and see if a serial killer is from there. Like, even if it's just like a, you know, mm-hmm. like somebody who only killed a couple people or whatever. We just like to read about true crime. Yeah. So we were driving through Jacksonville and we were like, I wonder if there's any Jacksonville um, serial killers. And Gary Ray Bowles came up. We were just going to read about him regardless. And we were scrolling through his list of victims and we we're like, hold up, somebody from Savannah? Yeah. And this guy actually was a very prominent figure. He came from a very prominent family here in Savannah. So it was kind of shocking that we didn't know about this, especially JT, you know, being so interested in serial yeah. killers the way he is and living in Savannah for most of his life. It's kind of crazy that... They swept it under the carpet, <coughs> for yes, sure. Yes, they did. You can find stuff online about it and all of that. If but you they, dig for it. Yeah, if you dig. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Basically, though, obviously... All the other um, murders were very, very heinous and whatnot, but we're, we are going to focus on Milton Bradley's murder a bit more. Um, so, Milton Bradley uh, was a local man here in Savannah. He owned Bradley's Lock and Key on Wright Square, which is still there to this day. Uh, that shop had been in his family since 1883. It's such a cool shop. It is it's a such very cool shop. cool shop. Just note, don't like, like go check it out if you come to Savannah, but don't like mention, obviously, yeah. always going to be a sore subject. So just don't mention like, you know, the, what happened to Milton Bradley or mm-hmm. don't, don't look for like a ghost hunt. 
I mean, just yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah. Don't. And I mean, there is a website, uh, I think it's called Savannah Terrors, and they do talk about like hauntings and stuff about Mr. Bradley, but, and they, they're like, oh, well, Mr. Bradley's still haunting Bradley's Lock and Key. Bradley's Lock and Key is probably haunted for a whole different reason. Yeah. And I do not think it is Mr. Bradley because of the nature of where it is located. It is located literally on top of the old cemetery. Yeah, it's right so, off the of right square, which we've, ta- we've, we've said talked multiple about times, times on this po- podcast. Very, very haunted place. you got Alice Riley. Um, they just got- dug up bones literally right next to the building. Exactly. So it's like... Just it's, insane. It, it's haunted, but not by Mr. Bradley. Nope. Mis- um, so just to clarify that. Yes. But um, so Mr. Bradley was 72 years old. Uh, he was a World War II veteran who survived his ship sinking while he was deployed. It's amazing. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Um, so even though he was 72, he was still kicking. Uh, he, uh, Despite he him having a traumatic head injury that he uh, got when he was in the Navy, basically his ship had been hit by an attack while in the Pacific during the World War. And... It caused it to sink, but Mr. Bradley was able to escape despite his injuries that he got in the process. In the process, but uh, pretty much what he did with his kind of older age was he worked at the key shop and he liked to visit lots of bars. He was very much so your standard Savannian. Oh yeah, you know he liked to go walking around the squares. He liked to. Uh, go to bars. We're bi- we're a big drinking town. That's not uncommon for people to want to. <laughs> it's true. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's not uncommon for people <laughs> to really enjoy going to multiple bars and stuff like that. And then, also, he was a very outgoing man. Very outgoing. Everybody who knew him apparently just like loved him. He was so such a sweet man. Apparently, um, but unfortunately, his extrovertedness did not help him in this situation. So. Interestingly enough, uh, something that uh, I read in one of the articles that I read about the incident said that uh, Mr. Bradley was not gay, allegedly, but the reason why he was at a gay bar called Faces, which is now Apes on Lincoln, if you do want to go visit that. Yeah, it's um, on it's it's on Lincoln and um, uh, what's the uh, Bryan Street? Yep, Bryan Street. Yep, it's right right off of Bay Street. Yeah, and it's a cool bar. It really is. Uh, But it used to be a gay bar called Faces. And so allegedly, allegedly, Mr. Bradley didn't really care if it was a gay bar or if it was a straight bar. He just really went for the happy hour specials. Hey. And I was like, you know, that's cool. Heard that. Um, But there are some suspicious things about it because of the reports from bartenders and other patrons that were there saying that Mr. Bradley was flirting back with Gary Ray Bowles. Yeah. Allegedly. Who cares? But I, I'm not saying he was or not, yeah, but it absolutely. is worth mentioning uh, just because they made sure to put, make a very big point about it. Sure. Um, but regardless. Doesn't matter if he was gay or not. Yeah. So basically, Gary Ray Bowles happened to be visiting Savannah. Just happened to be. No, I think he definitely stopped here in Savannah. Um, he stopped in May 4th, on May 4th, 1994. And by then, he had already killed two other people. He, like I said, often targeted older gay men. And so he was looking for his next victim. So he went to uh, pretty much the only gay bar at the time, which was Faces. Still to this day, Savannah does not have a thriving gay bar scene. No, Um, we have Club One. We have one. Um, to That's more of like a dancey thing, but they yeah. have bars. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a club. Yeah, Duh. so um, it was kind of like a uh, an easy choice for him, essentially. Mm-hmm. So it was a popular gay bar in Savannah. It's now Aves on Lincoln, and it was where he met Mr. Bradley. Now, Mr. Bradley wasn't gay, allegedly. He frequented various bars around town, uh, both gay and straight, to take advantage of happy hours and specials, So, uh, which I wouldn't put it past a regular Savannian anyways yeah. people do that all the time cheap alcohol cheap alcohol it's true and so uh where was I yes uh so uh Mr. Bradley like I said was known for being very friendly so he went up to Gary Ray Bowles because he didn't recognize him 
And so he started a conversation uh, with Mr. Uh, with Gary Ray Bowles. So Gary Ray Bowles had taken advantage of Mr. Bradley's kindness and open demeanor, and having found he was uh, what he was looking for, which is his third victim. So the following that makes him a serial killer. Yep, three victims. So yep, so he became a serial killer in Savannah. Yes. Um, so basically, the next day. At the golf course that is off of President Street, it's a very lu- like luxury golf course yeah. um, here in Savannah. And so one of the employees who worked at the golf course found Mr. Bradley's body behind a maintenance shed on the golf course. So she said, and I quote, she, or uh, actually it wasn't a direct quote from her, but from a crime journalist, um, Pat Lalama. La La, la, uh, la Yama, um, something of that nature. Sure. Uh, she said, she notices a kind of lump on the ground and realizes she is looking at a body. So immediately the woman calls the police and the police arrive and determine there had been a violent struggle at the scene. The victim, an older man, showed visible signs of trauma to the body and his pants pockets had been turned inside out indicating a robbery. Mm. But one detail stood out And uh, the quote from the police chief who gave uh, kind of the statement about this crime said, I saw in his mouth leaves and dirt were protruding. The thought that went through my head is they didn't get there by accident. There had to be a reason they were put there, Captain John Best with the Savannah Police Department said. An autopsy showed Bradley had been strangled to death and brutally beaten. The autopsy Mm. uh, also showed that it was the assault was so bad that the bones in his neck broke. Jeez. Yeah. God, that is violent. It was a very violent death. And and, and the the leaves in the dirt, you know. I mean, this is a this is a World That's War so II veteran. Yeah. This is a World War II veteran. This is a per, this is a man who like you know fought for our country, and you're just gonna you're gonna kill him, but then you're gonna like desecrate his body, you know, by shoving dirt and leaves down his throat that's just gary ray bowles had no respect for his victims in any regard um and we'll get into that slightly with the uh with the trial of it being considered possibly a hate crime um like out of homophobia but basically though um uh captain best also said there was a lot of rage that went into this murder there was an excessive amount of force used to kill the victim. It was overkill, is what yeah. the captain said. So investigators learned Bradley had been last seen leaving a bar with a man who seemingly had been flirting with him. That man, a witness told them, returned back to the bar about 30 minutes to an hour later without Mr. Bradley. Wow. Yeah. It only took... So he literally... I mean, I'm thinking about how long it's going to take him to get to the, you're, you're talking about about, I'd say six, seven minute drive down Bay Street. They probably took Bay Street. They connected uh, uh, to East Presidents via that cutoff. And then East Presidents down about a half a mile, you get to the golf course on the right. So you're looking at easily a six, seven minute drive. And then he just got there and just murdered him. I mean, just murdered him, you know. Like it was nothing. Like it was nothing left in there. You know, the murder probably took, you know, five minutes, and then so so there might have been some conversation uh, before, or he might have taken his time after, but that took him no time. Exactly, that is wild. And what was disturbing about that, especially, is that it really shows how little care he had about his actions because he went back to the bar. Yeah, and it was almost like he was trying to find see if he could maybe find another, another one while one. he was there. That's exactly and what it it's was. Like, that's so creepy. Jeez. That is so disturbing to hear. Um, I hope they put him to death. <laughs> we'll get into it. Um, but yes, so that was the murder of Milton Bradley. Um, so after Milton Bradley, two weeks later, he moved on to Hilliard, Florida, where he um, murdered Albert Morris. And Albert Morris was gagged, beaten, blasted with a shotgun, and then strangled on June thirteenth. This man was insanely violent oh in his God. crimes. Like That's crazy. he wanted them to suffer. Like 
And it was almost yeah. like he wanted every way to kill us. I don't, I don't know why it, it keeps surprising me because, like, I mean, uh, all of the, like, a ton of these serial killers, obviously, they don't do it quick. Mm-hmm. And if they do do it quick, it's still going to be, oh, like, ultra, like, super, super duper violent. But, um, you know, it's just like hearing what this guy does to people, it, it just, it shocks me. Yeah. Still. Like, like I'll he, never not be shocked. Like, he definitely <laughs> had a very similar method so like yeah. you know the beating and then the strangling but every once in a while he just would throw that curveball in there of like almost like he was like oh you know what would be fun is to shoot this guy first it can't yeah. cause him any even more pain it's like it, it just blows my mind but in uh each case the alleged killer would hang out in gay bars when he met a likely prospect he would offer household chores and sex Uh, in exchange for a place to stay. Then, after a short period, he would violently kill his host and steal money, and if possible, a car to take him away from the locale. Yeah. So, yeah. This is, like, right before, uh, like, technology starts to get big, you know, to where, Mm -hmm. like, you know, we have CCTV and all of that, and, you know, this is probably just only a couple years before that starts. Well, that's actually... you can just take someone's car, and it's fine. Oh, yeah. Well, so it's interesting. There's a lot of articles that go into exactly that, of why he was able to get away with this for as long as he did. You can't do that now. Yeah, you cannot do that now, Um, because it's just not possible, really, Um, but... Police actually identified Bowles as a suspect early on, but by keeping on the move, he stayed ahead of them. Uh But the case was profiled on America's Most Wanted in July 1994, which should have been what actually got him, but it wasn't. So here's the the kicker is that... Uh, he, he was profiled on America's Most Wanted in July 1994. At that time, Bowles was sharing a house with several others. And those people he was living with called the police when they saw his picture on TV. Wow. And, but because uh, Gary Ray Bowles was, had a tan and a mustache, the police thought they, he was the wrong man and let him go. They apparently failed Whoa. to check him for identifying marks because he had three tattoos and old knifing scars that were very oh identifiable. God. That's like that's like a, a Dahmer. The, the, the Dahmer thing. Yeah. yeah. Immediately, I thought like that is like a massive police mess up. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's insane. I I bet they're gonna get the police officer of the year award for that. Oh. <laughs> you know, that's God. that's about the only thing that'll get you. Yeah. Oh God, right. T. Anyways, um, but yeah, I thought when I read that, I was like, wow. his roommates literally, literally were like, "This is your guy. Please take him." Bro. Like before he murders somebody else, and the police were like, "Nah, he's too tan. He's too tan." And I'm like, "What in the?" I'm like, "We're in Florida, literally." <laughs> and it took them until November Dude. to figure that one out. But Dude. anyways. So, and let me guess, he kills more, mm-hmm. and they could have they could have saved people's lives. Yes. Jeez. So um, here's the murder that got him. So on November 20th, a 47 year old man named Jay Hinton failed to show up for work at a flower shop in Jacksonville, Florida. Mm. His sister went to check on him and found him murdered. A mm. massive cinder block had been dropped on him. He had been strangled, and toilet paper and a rag were shoved in his throat. But at this point, police were uh, there didn't make the connection to Bowles as the I-95 killer had been out of the spotlight for some time, for like a couple months. I'm like, how do you forget about a serial killer? Like, that sounds like a... That's not him. Literally, it sounds like a bunch of hogwash. Hogwash. Yes. So, here's the thing, though, and he probably would have gotten away with it. If it wasn't for for those meddling kids. kids. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, we've been watching Scooby Doo. Oh yeah, um, but yeah. Thank you, Netflix. Yes, thank you, Netflix. Um, <laughs> but investigators did, however, locate a pay stub belonging to a day laborer named Timothy Whitfield, Ooh. which happened to be Gary Ray Bull's, uh Oh, what is it? His uh, not ally. It's a uh, accomplice. No, 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 no. Oh, what do you mean, Alan? Like his uh, name that he used and said. Oh, alias. Alias, thank you. Um, Yeah, that was his alias. So they made calls indicating to keep an eye out for Whitfield. 
And he eventually showed up at the employment office because he was looking for a job, obviously, and he was arrested and taken in for questioning. He denied the murder at first, but couldn't maintain his innocence for long. Bowles would eventually confess to all six murders. And when asked why he had confessed, he said, so the killings would stop. I feel like that's exactly, I feel like that's what he's going to say to like, maybe they'll, maybe, yeah. you know, if they see that I'm, I'm remorseful and that I want to stop myself, uh, you know, they're not going to put me to death. That's literally. Well, they don't know Florida. Apparently. Duval. <laughs> God, we're not um, Jacksonville fans, but regardless. No, but it's fun to say Duval. Anyways. And I, and I like Jacksonville. We like Jacksonville. We go through oh, a yeah. bunch. Well, yeah, no, it's fine. Great I'm people just, from Jacksonville. Yes. Um, but yeah, another quote from Gary Ray Bowles was, I didn't want to kill nobody, but I did. I don't know why. And I'm like, sounds like heard anybody it. who got caught. Heard it over and over again, buddy. Mm-hmm. So let's go into the trial. Okay. So a Duval County jury convicted and recommended death for Bowles in 1996. So two years after his murders, um, uh, but two years later, his death sentence was overturned by the Florida Supreme Court. Mm. Another jury convicted and recommended death for Bowles in 1999. That sentence stuck even after a five-hour delay as the U.S. Supreme Court mulled whether to entertain his 11th hour appeal for a stay on that Thursday night before. My thing is, why have the death penalty if you aren't going to use it on that guy? Like, right? That's what... You that's know, what it's for. I, that's what it's for, you know? Yeah. I mean, whether you're against the death penalty or not, I know that, I might, I know that might, you know, uh, hurt to hear. But at the same time, it's like, you know, why have the death penalty if you're just going to, like, leave a, a, like, let a guy live who destroyed so many people and desecrated their bodies afterwards? Absolutely. No. I mean, no. Um, so... He pled guilty in the other two Florida murder cases and received life life in prison for those convictions. Um, But he was not prosecuted for the three out-of-state murders. So Mr. Bradley's murder was not prosecuted for that. But in 2002, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in... So I'm going to get into like a little bit of a legal thing. Okay. um, So that way you guys understand why he wanted this, but... So in 2002, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Atkins versus Virginia that the use of the death penalty against individuals with intellectual disability constitutes cruel and unusual punishment Mm. in violation of the Eighth Amendment. Twelve years later, in Hall versus Florida, the court struck down Florida's approach to enforcing that prohibition, holding that the state had unconstitutionally required death row prisoners to meet a 70 iq score cut off before they could be considered intellectually disabled Hmm. so that that is the law that he his lawyers were going for essentially okay they were trying that was how they were going to try to get him off death row essentially sure Sure. so good lawyers mm -hmm. so bulls pled guilty and was sentenced to death in um to death for the 1994 murder of the Jacksonville man in a series of killings targeting gay men. He confessed to the murder of four other gay men and is serving two life sentences. His intellectual disability claim presents evidence of an IQ score of 74. Within the accepted range of intellectual disability and neuropsychological uh, tests results showing brain damage consistent with an intellectual disability. Bowles presented statements from witnesses who described him as forgetful, gullible, naive, immature, socially inept, impulsive, and lacking a sense of consequences for his actions. Those are all the words that I would describe a disorganized serial killer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He had impaired language skills, could not keep up in conversation, struggled with memory, and could not perform day-to-day tasks such as utilizing public transportation, using money, or seeking employment. The Florida courts sum, uh, summarily uh, denied Bull's petition as untimely filed. 
That was how they got around it. Mm. And so the Supreme, uh, Florida Supreme Court ruled that under state law enacted to establish procedures for litigating death penalty intellectual disability claims, Bowles should have filed his claim in 2004. But he didn't. Nope. And so they're like, well, we can kill this guy because he technically did not file at the right time. Very nice. Um, so, however, Bowles argued that raising his claim at that time, while Florida was applying its 70 IQ score cutoff, would have been futile and he could not be required to raise a claim that the courts would have rejected out of hand. Rather, he said it became appropriate for him to raise his claim after the Florida Supreme Court ruled in 2016 that Hall applied uh, retroactively in Florida intellectual disability cases. The Florida Supreme Court rejected those arguments, writing that Bull's inaction should be ignored on the basis of the perceived futility of his claim. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That is Word like a, lasagna. Yes, yeah, sorry. That is a direct quote yeah. from like um, the death penalty like uh, site that the government- Committee. No, the death penalty <laughs> like uh, yeah. no, no. factor that the government has. So it's big words, but yes. I was like, I feel like that's the most, I am not a lawyer, so I felt like that was the, no, most, no, this is right. Absolutely. the most appropriate way to describe that to y'all. Absolutely. So- in 2017, Gary Ray Bowles, whose IQ score is slightly above the cutoff, had previously prevented him from obtaining relief under Atkins in Florida's courts, filed an intellectual disability petition in state court seeking to vacate his death sentence. He still tried, even in 2017, to yeah. do it again. Um, and well, the, wouldn't you? <laughs> right. And yeah. so, well, his lawyers were also pushing for like the fact that the reason why his... Uh, you know, victims were all gay was that um, his intellectual disability basically caused him to have homophobic thoughts. Okay. That was what they were going for to give it justness, essentially, to make it seem like he's not a serial killer. His intellectual disability caused him to feel this way again about gay people, which is like, no, I think there's something very deeply rooted wrong with him outside of his IQ. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anyways, so... Uh, The petition sat idly for two years while new counsel was appointed to represent Bowles. Then shortly after new counsel was appointed and before his petition could be reviewed, Governor Ron DeSantis issued a death warrant scheduling Bowles' execution for August 22nd, 2019 by lethal injection in Stark, Florida. Nice. No electric chair? No electric chair. Oh, man. I I wanted him to get Tanner. Oh, my God. Anyways, um, if you did not know, um, if you did not know, Stark, Florida is where they execute everyone in the state of Florida. Um, Yeah, like Bundy. Yeah, they executed Bundy. Uh, Is that where they executed Eileen Mornos? I don't know. I'm not sure, so I can't can't say that, but yeah. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. But they, yes, uh, regardless, though, uh, and also I think the electric chair had been outlawed in the state of Florida mm-hmm. um, by 2019. So I think all that the the only option was lethal injection. Um, no other options, because since then, obviously, sure. new things have been added to different states and whatnot. Um But yes, so the Florida state and federal courts have refused to review the merits of his claim, and he has petitioned the U.S. Supreme Court seeking a stay of execution or review of his claim up until the day of his execution. Yeah. He continued and continued and continued, but literally the state of Florida was like, nah. Yeah. So. I I mean, that's that's the thing is like, in any other state, he would have had a chance. I mean, I mean, even in the most, because I think in Georgia, he would have had yeah. a chance. But Florida. Florida doesn't tolerate that. Florida has a zero serial killer t- t- uh, uh, tolerance. Yes. They really go hard on the serial killers, they, which they should. But like, I don't know. I will say, though, he did sit on death row for 21 years. Yeah, they all do. Yeah. Um, and he was executed on August 22nd, 2019, at 57 years old. His final meal, uh, if for those of you who are interested in that. uh, All of us. Was three cheeseburgers, french fries, and bacon. Did we know where the cheeseburgers came from? No, I'm assuming they probably gave him McDonald's cheeseburgers because the, I think. I was really hoping it was going to be Ralph's oh, on gosh. on uh, US 19. Probably not. If you're ever on US 19 and you're heading through um, Chiefland, Stop at Ralph's. Well, that would have been so far away from yeah. Stark. But get a get a burger, get a cheeseburger or a burger, and a peanut butter milkshake. Yeah, it's very Trust good. Trust me. But, um, 
Yeah, so here's the thing. is like I'm pretty sure, it, it, at least in recent years, and it should have been applied to this particular execution because it was so recent, uh-huh. is that um, there's a $25 limit mm. to your last meal because there's so many people that you've seen like who have been on death row and I they're like... Caviar. Yeah, well, yeah, they're like, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and like, and you know, and then there's some people that are like, who refuse their last meal, or they're like, I just want a cup of coffee, or whatever. Sure. So I think you have to stay within a $25 limit, so I'm assuming they probably just went to McDonald's, because I really highly doubt they cared. They don't. So. They don't in Florida. Yeah. They don't. That's our home state. We know. Yeah. They don't care. Anyways, um, and then also, he had written a long, long letter mm-hmm. as his final statement to be read after he was dead. Um, and some quotes from that uh, said that he was sorry for all the pain and suffering he, I, uh, and I quote, for all the pain and suffering I have ca- caused. And he also told his mother he was sorry for his crimes and quote, Having to deal with your son being called a monster is terrible, and I'm so very sorry. No, he's not. I never wanted this to be my life. You don't wake up one day and decide to become a serial killer. And, like, <laughs> it sounds... boo It does. It sounds like he was trying to save face in, like, the yeah. final hour. And he was like, maybe they'll feel guilty about executing me if, you know, I write this letter about how sorry I was. And it's like, you took six people's lives. Yeah. Nobody feels sympathy for that. You Not know, a single, I don't care. And really gruesome ways too, you know? Yeah, like it was I mean. A, honestly, he deserved what he got. And, um, you know, yeah. glad that the state of Florida did what they needed I, to do. I want, I would, I want to, I want y'all, uh, you know, send us a message or comment about either what you think or what you know of why he shoved things down people's throat. I, I have been pondering that this entire time. I have been too. Um, did, you didn't see anything about it when no, you were doing the research? There's no like... She does pretty thorough research. But. Yeah, there's literally no indication of exactly why he did that besides it being a signature. And he never said it, like bragging no. or anything he like really that? He really didn't brag because I think he had been, you know... He had a shot of not being executed, so he's not going to be... Exactly. He's not going to be braggy. Yeah, Understood. he wasn't the type of serial killer that was hmm. like, oh yeah, I did this and this and this, you know, and like was super proud of it. I think he was advised by his legal team to like to, shut up. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because that was going to be his best shot because it was sure. like very damning evidence against him. So but yeah, comment down below. Uh, let us know if you're watching on YouTube, let us know what you think, um, you know, why he did that. Cause I, I would love to, you know, hear y'all's opinions or if you know anything, if I, you're like, Oh, I read this one thing and this is what it said. There you know? is a documentary on um, Gary Ray Bowles. So maybe, if we watch that documentary, maybe we'll find some. I want to watch it. Yeah. yeah. What, where, what? It's what? on like what? Hulu, I think. It's on one of those like oh, yeah. platforms. Okay. Um, Let's wait. watch it tonight. Yeah. Date absolutely. night. Absolutely. <laughs> Red <laughs> wine. Yes. J- okay. JT and I have a serial killer documentary date nights yeah, often. Like, like every, you know, dark couples. Yes. Um, um, but yeah, so. It is a really awful case, and it is very sad that Savannah doesn't, you know, really talk about it, uh, because Mr. Bradley's legacy is kind of, like, left with just, like, this, like, oh, he died a really bad way. Like, yeah. like that's about his, you But know. let's remember he is a military veteran who mm-hmm. survived... A uh, shipwreck. A shipwreck. I mean, you can't, you can't get better than that. A you ship know? attack, actually. He's a, a hero, so... And he lived, so, he lived a really long life considering the amount of damage his brain took. Absolutely. I was like, that's really, like... He's hardcore. Hardcore dude. Um, hardcore dude. Didn't also, what you know, if you're in Savannah, go to Apes on Lincoln and have a drink for Mr. Bradley. You know, I feel like his spirit Straight would up. be the type to be like, yeah, nice. You yeah. Know? No, <laughs> so, for sure. For and sure. I know there are people in Savannah who do that, who go yeah. to Apes on Lincoln to have a drink in his honor. So um, hmm. Gary Ray Bowles was a trash human being, though. And yes, it is interesting to read about serial killers, but by no means are we glamorizing this man's actions. No. We just are here to read the facts and how it affects, you know. Yeah. I, uh, I honestly, uh, I remember getting the, um, I remember getting the, uh, 
notification on my phone from Associated Press saying that he's been executed. Uh, now you know you know it's only a couple years ago, um, and uh, I was I was lit. Yeah. I was like I told I was like babe babe they killed Gary Ray Bowles finally <laughs> like yeah. like woo <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was pretty pretty exciting thing because you know he didn't deserve another second uh, you know on this earth yeah. after what he did to you know just all those all those men yeah absolutely cool but um the next time we do the true crime tuesdays we're going to talk about samuel little Mm -hmm. uh which is considered he is considered the most prolific serial killer in america's history uh, at the moment because of how many victims he had um but he did kill three women in the city of savannah but he killed three 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 They, they found three i thought it was only one oh no they have three okay Wow. So, yeah, we're g- we'll go into that in the next time that we do True Crime Tuesdays. Let us know if you enjoy this. Um, yeah, please you know, do. I know oftentimes, like, uh, some people are, like, only paranormal and only true crime. But we do like to dabble in both of them because, yeah. you know, that is also a lot of people's interests as well. For sure. So let us know if you enjoyed this and if you have any uh, type of true crime that you would like us to cover even. So... Absolutely. Um, With that, though, my name is Madison Timmons. And I'm JT Timmons. And stay spooky, y'all.